Well, it's 930 and uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, my name's Amy Jamantis. I'm the director at the Urban Research Initiatives at uh, the Fit Center uh, Leader for Leadership and Community. And um, I'm also here with uh, Alex, and I'm going to give her a second to introduce herself. She's got a fascinating background. Oh, thank you. Um, just letting everyone know, I won't be unmuting. So if my picture doesn't automatically pop up, just guess who I am. Um, so my name is Alex. I'm a current undergrad at the University of Dayton. I'm about to graduate this December with my bachelor's in mechanical engineering. And then I'm immediately going to become an official graduate assistant and work with Amy while I am pursuing my master's of public administration. Um, so I can't answer a lot of questions about the very intricate details of the grant writing process, but I will be assisting Amy in talking about general writing practices and anything else that I could contribute uh, with my technical background. Thanks, Alex. And so my background is uh, I've been working uh, 40 years in the field in education, human services, housing development, and behavioral health. And written a hundred million, more than a hundred million in grants. Uh, so you'll leave this saying to yourself, well, if she can do that, I can write 200 million, uh, which is the appropriate thought because it, you don't have to be a uh, research scientist or a nuclear physicist to be a good grant writer. Um, it uh, is something that's achievable for everyone. And this is gonna be a real informal training. Um, as we go forward, feel free to um, just um, introduce yourself in the chat um, and we'll go ahead and get started now. So take, if you haven't introduced yourself in the chat, uh, take a second and, and do that to everyone, to meet everyone. So uh, for this training, we're going to be, and I hope everybody can see uh, the learning objectives. I want to make sure that my slides are advancing okay. Um, the objectives is we're going to talk today about how to find funders, develop partnerships. We're going to talk about writing treatment or tips, um, how to formulate needs assessments, timelines, outcomes. We're going to talk about the capacity, how to put your best foot forward when discussing your agency. We'll also talk about letters of commitment, support, resumes and bios. Um, and some of the next steps after the application. And up here on the next screen, uh, this is a QR code for the grant resources. Um, so, you know, you can uh, use your phone for that. Uh, we will also be emailing everyone the, the link in case they have any trouble using the QR code. Um, and this will take you to a site where we have um, examples of successful grants. We've got letters of support and commitment templates. Um, we have uh, logic models. Um, a variety of uh, different materials, and we will make that available for you, and we're constantly updating that. So if there is something that you would like in that uh, grant resource, uh, just email uh, myself um, or uh, Alex, and uh, we're happy to add to that. So let's talk a little bit about finding funders uh, to match your needs um, and how to match them to the priorities of the funder. Um, so every funder pretty much, not 100%, uh, but probably around 96% of the funders have a web page uh, listing um, what they're interested in. Um, on uh, today's uh, slide, 
Um, if you we click on this, uh, this will go uh, right to uh, the Levin Family Foundation, and you get to see uh, their uh, website as an example, their local foundation. And this just uh, shows you what their current projects are, um, you know, how to get to know us. Huh? Are you trying to show the website? Yes. You still have the PowerPoint shared. Okay. Okay. Um, so, huh. We will, we will not be sharing websites at this time, um, but we may circle around and, and figure out how to do that. Um, I guess I need to stop share and take you to the window. Um, so this um, just shows, websites show the geographic limits of the Love and Family Foundation, which interestingly enough, um, actually, is um, both here in Ohio, primarily the Dayton area, and then they also do some giving in Israel. Um, so I kind of wanted to point that out since that was kind of an unusual combination uh, but goes along with the heritage of the family that started uh, the original foundation. And here we're going to go to the Dayton Foundation, and um, I will take you to their site. Um, so I'm going to stop this uh, screen share and take you directly uh, to their site. And so uh, this gives you an idea about their initiatives. And um, they have information for nonprofits. Um, if you can see, I'm scrolling down. They talk about who's eligible for a grant, uh, what we fund, types of grants. Uh, they do a registration uh, for their grant uh, program orientation. They have a recorded uh, version of that. Um, and lots of information. Um, so if you click on types of grants, uh, this takes you to, you can see Tanya's picture there. Uh, she's often the first person that you talk to when you're at uh, the Dayton Foundation. And um, they talk about the different grants that they have. They have Greenlight Grants, which is a wonderful introductory level grant. They have larger discretionary grants. And each one of those uh, grant sources has a place where you can click uh, to learn more about how you can apply for those grants. And one of the things that you will find out is that they're uh, very interested in having you attend their orientation, though it's not mandatory, but they're also interested in talking to you about your grants. And that's one thing that you really wanna do when you're contacting these local foundations, uh, you wanna read carefully to see if they need to talk to you before you submit a grant. Um, you know, and whether you want to pitch your ideas via email or call them um, is up to you. It's really what you feel more most comfortable with. But building a relationship with that uh, funder is really important. And when you talk to them, it's really important that you understand that they're, what their priorities are, what their geographical area is. Um, and so that you are able to, um, you know, mention that in the email or phone call and make the connection between your wish list and um, what they're uh, talking with you about. So hopefully we're loading back to um, our PowerPoint. And uh, once again, we get to see Tanya's face here. Um, and she says here to help. So that's a, um, a wonderful thing. <laughs> Excuse me a second. And here you can also look up funders on a guide star. Like today, I've uh, highlighted on guide star. Whoops, let me go back to that. Uh, the Matil Family Foundation. 
The Mitteal Family Foundation is another local foundation that um, is very generous, very appropriate for you to consider. If you're serving children or serving uh, families in a way that benefits the children and the families. So we're, if you were to click on um, GuideStar and you can set up your own free account in GuideStar, you notice that they say, hi, Amy Jamantis. So I've set up my free account and that lets me also look at their um, tax information. And on the next slide, I'll show you what that looks like. Um, so when you actually go to um, a tax form for a foundation, when you go, you have to go through, because it's a 990 form is the name of a foundation, and it's called 990PF for um, a foundation. And when you go through their tax return, a lot of them at the end will list all the people that they've given money to um, in the past, and they will also list how much they've given. So I really use that as an indicator on how much I want to ask for. I really try to kind of skim through, but I have to be honest, I don't add up and 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 do the averages uh, for the entire list of, of, of those that they've given to, but I get kind of ballpark it. And I kind of make sure that I'm in that average ballpark, um, you know, in my ask. Or if I'm going to be above that ballpark, I want to be able to defend that. Um, and one of the ways is if you've got money from them in the past, they may know you have a lot of confidence in what you're capable of delivering. Um, and they will uh, be willing to um, support a larger gift. Um, I always, when I'm pitching to people, either by email, introducing myself and my project, or by phone, uh, introducing the project, I really try to um, give an idea how much I'm thinking about asking for, and I do it almost in the sense of a question, um, and then I wait to see their response. Um, and, you know, sometimes that's just even judging nonverbals, you know, if like there's a hesitation and a long pause on their part, I may realize that I'm shooting too high. Um, or, you know, or I may actually ask them, does that seem to be a, an appropriate request for the size of agency we are or for this particular um, project? And then you really want to listen closely to what they say. Here I'm showing you the website. Oh, I wish I wouldn't do that. Uh, the website for uh, Montgomery County. Um, and I was trying to scroll down here a little bit, but uh, that didn't work out too well. Um, so this gives their funding applications. Uh, Human Services every five years has a very, very large um, application that's interested uh, and open to funding uh, education, health, um, human services, uh, workforce development, food programs, um, and that's open every five years. That's something that you should consider. So we're looking at funding 2023 that has already been awarded. Um, so their next one should be coming up in, in 2028. But that's something, you know, that's a long way away. But it's uh, really something to think about because it's a, a very large um, amount of money. Um, and this just gives you the focus areas that we've already discussed, you know, income, education, life skills, health, safety, and, and poverty. Um, and so City of Dayton has community um, engagement uh, grants. 
If your neighborhood association or business association, a lot of times you are the one that they are interested in, in terms of um, receiving your application. Uh, so that's certainly something that you can consider. And once again, after the show, you can click on any of the hyperlinks in the, the slides, and this will take you directly to the City of Dayton uh, site. And Ohio has uh, gotten together very recently and has a combined um, application site for all their agencies. It used to be you would have to go to individual agencies like Department of Education or Department of Development to see their grants. Now they're um, concentrated in this uh, one site. And so you're able to go through the site and um, find out what's the current uh, applications. And so that's a, a wonderful resource for you as well. And uh, so the granddaddy of them all, or grand grandmother of them all, we don't want to be sexist here today, is uh, grants.gov. Uh, Grants.gov is a wonderful uh, resource for you. You can actually subscribe um, and receive through your emails all the different open uh, grant opportunities. You probably want to filter that because you are going to get uh, announcements from the Department of Defense. Um, you are going to get um, information from the State Department about stuff that they're doing in uh, Ukraine or, you know, stuff that they're doing in all sorts of different countries. Uh, so to the extent you can, you want to put in uh, keywords and filter that down to the two or three different agencies um that you're interested in and they have a lot of resources on their website um and don't be fearful about applying to the federal government because they do have um grant opportunities that are open for smaller organizations um and they can be a very benevolent uh uh contributor um, a lot of times, if you're dealing with HOD, they understand that they're dealing with smaller shelters or smaller agencies, you know, and um, they've made their process um, kind of open and helpful to you. Um, so that's something certainly for you to consider. Um, so when you get um, go on any of these sites, you see what's a typical request for proposals, although this might not be the name that they use. Uh, the federal government sometimes uses the name notice of funding uh, availability or notice of funding opportunity, NOFA. Um, they may be described as a request for um, application rather than proposal, but all those uh, will ha still have very similar information. They'll tell you what's the eligibility, they'll give you the deadlines, um, you know, what's the final submission, do you have to submit a letter of intent, what are the requirements, what do they want specifically in your narrative? And then not everybody will have it. Um, a lot of foundations don't have it, but a lot of government sources will actually give you a rubric. And you really want to pay attention to this rubric because it is literally gold. Um, when I'm writing a grant, I make sure that everything I write has a headline that connects back to that rubric. Um, so if they're saying, you know, uh, the criteria is that the individual shows extensive uh, evidence-based solutions uh, for their educational um, program, um, then I will have a header in my grant that says, you know, 
evidence-based solutions, and it will correspond exactly to the rubric. Sometimes there's different questions in the narrative, and sometimes you want to include both the narrative and the rubric questions, but all these include the rubric. Um, because you will find that some of the reviewers are not as um, comprehensive as other reviewers. And if they cannot quickly see that your answer matches to their rubric, they may skim through your answer and feel you haven't addressed it. So in other words, they're not looking around for making sure that you're corresponding to their rubric. Um, they're kind of forcing you to highlight uh, that rubric and your, your response. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later when we do the program uh, description. Um, here's an example of Key Bank. Um, so if you uh, apply for a grant at KeyBank or Chase Bank, um, they typically will have a lot of instructions on their website. I will tell you, sometimes banks don't want to hear from us directly. Sometimes they want your first introduction to, the, to them to be the actual application. Um, but other times they do want to hear from you and they'll list the community managers in your area that you want to talk to. Uh, so you want to take that uh, advantage and go ahead and, and discuss your project or email them. Uh, the banks all kind of use similar kinds of applications. Um, and so that's the nice thing. Um, is that you can often cut and paste from your key bank application into a Chase Bank application or, a, you know, a PNC application. Uh, they're all very similar and pretty much they're all online. Um, many of them are using a specific company called Cyber Grants um, to hold their applications. And we're going to talk about each of these today. We're going to talk about the abstract, the needs assessment, the proposed services, timelines, outcomes and measurements, evaluation, and budget justification. Um, so when we say needs assessment, it may be that the grant application doesn't have a question that says needs. Um, but if they're asking you about the target population, or they say describe the community, that is a needs question. Um, and so you will find that, you know, the, the, these are the major categories everybody's asking. They may have different questions to elicit this information, like the project description, um, maybe a question like, what do you use the funding for? Um, or, um, you know, tell us how this uh, project connects to our priorities. Well, that's asking you to describe your, your uh, project, um, even though they didn't say specifically describe your uh, project. Um, the other thing is, uh, this is the information that you want to dig up um, and have ready. Um, you want to have your mission. You want to have information about your history and leadership. Um, you want to be able to describe your key staff, your existing services. Do you have prior successful results? If you're a totally new agency, um, are you partnering with individuals that have um, good results? And, you know, have you talked to that other agency and are they comfortable with you sharing their results? Because um, sometimes new startups can really build on um, the founders. Um, and then you may need to put job descriptions and resumes together. Um, that's typically in federal grants, not so much in um, 
foundation grants, but sometimes they are also in foundation grants. And the key thing about um, partnerships is every funder realizes that they don't have enough money to go around. They would like to see the biggest bang for their uh, buck. Um, so they're very much interested in um, who are your partners? Who do you send referrals to? Who sends referrals to you? Do you have students from UD or Wright State? Um, you could list your um, funders as partners. Um, you know, what similar agencies do you work with? Um, neighborhood associations, other nonprofits, all of those can be partners. The city and county can be partners. Don't mention anyone in your application as a partner unless you've talked to them first. Um, but most organizations uh, realize um, that funders don't want to see um, applications from single agencies that they're very interested in partnerships. Um, so there's going to be a real emphasis on, you know, sort of um, a sharing back and forth of organizations working together. And I want to give a commercial on uh, 10 o'clock on Saturdays, the fourth Saturday, we have an informal grants writing group. It's not really a training, uh, but we get together and discuss projects. And it's specifically for smaller uh, agencies who may not have developed those partners. And we've actually been connecting a lot of organizations that are now working together on uh, grants or are able to ask for letters of support from other uh, partners. So that's something you might wanna think about. All righty, everybody. Um, so we're going to do a quick review for questions. Um, of course, we don't want everybody just speaking all at once. So please post in the chat if you have any questions. We're giving ourselves about five minutes for this. So if you don't really want to hear the questions or anything, this could be a time to use the bathroom or to stand up and stretch your legs or, or anything like that. But please post any questions you have in the chat. And also don't worry if you're not really sure if you have questions or if like, you feel as if your questions weren't necessarily answered right now, because later on we have other different sessions for um, asking questions for Amy, and I'll be facilitating the chat and reading everything out loud for Amy and also for the recording. So I can also probably highlight myself as well. There we go. All righty. Okay, so Jessica asks if you could please share the details of the informal grants group again. Okay, so it is, and um, we will send you out more information. So we're going to do a follow-up email where we'll send you um, an evaluation of the training and some resources and a link to the Google uh, Drive that I discussed. But it is Saturday mornings. It's very informal. I bring some breakfast snacks, and we sit down and discuss projects that they're working on. It's kind of a planning meeting. Um, we share information. Um, that meeting may end up with individual technical assistance uh, sessions being scheduled if we don't get everything done in the meeting. Um, but I share resources. Um, I may point out um, funders that they could uh, should consider. I may help them um, find uh, research information that supports their projects. Uh, so it's very informal. Uh, you're welcome to come. It's at the Fifth Center. It's in the downstairs in the multipurpose room. All righty. Um, there is one question I can answer. Uh, Jennifer, everybody will be receiving a copy of the PowerPoint um, and the drive. All the resources that we shared today, you will all get a copy in your emails with links and everything. So do not worry if you've missed anything or, or um, if you feel as if there's a resource you saw that you would really like to use, everything will be shared. Okay, we do have one other question. Um, are LLCs just as able to receive grants as the 50 
501c3s? 501c3. Yes. Yes. Thanks, Alex. Um, no. LLCs are at a disadvantage. Um, so an LLC is a limited liability company and it is a for-profit. There are some funds that you can apply for as a for-profit. Uh, so to use as an example, we're working with Central State and a group of urban farmers. Um, for some of the application of the urban farmers may be an LLC, and for some applications, they are able to apply as a for-profit. However, I'd say probably 90% of funds uh, specifically coming out of foundations um, are for um, nonprofits only. Um, so if you haven't gotten your nonprofit uh, status yet, um, if you're a small organization, there's a relatively quick process uh, to gain approved through the state, um, and we can provide you more information about that. Um, the other opportunity is to be an LLC that's working with a, a nonprofit. Um, and then in some funds, like the ARPA fund that the city of Dayton did, I believe they did open that up uh, to local uh, businesses. Um, and so, you know, there are government uh, funds that are specific to uh, local businesses. Uh, so it's not totally out of the scope, but it's a little bit more difficult. All right, we have one other question. Um, it says, when a foundation has a draft due date and says that this draft due date is optional, is that something you recommend that they submit drafts in a similar way that you mentioned? Um, it, it's important to reach out to agencies prior to submitting applications. Yes. So whenever they give you a draft uh, due date um, so that they want to look at your proposal, I would really suggest you do that. I mean, sometimes it's not possible because you found out about the application too late to meet their deadline, um, but it's a wonderful opportunity for them to look at your application, see where your, you know, your emphasis seems different than their priorities. Um, we're working with a group uh, that we're doing that now with the Ohio Humanities uh, Council, and their feedback was very, very helpful. Um, because of the, we define humanities one way, they defined it very strictly around history and philosophy um, and not so much art. So they gave us some excellent feedback on how we could uh, change our proposal. And yes, I always urge you um, to um, speak with them if, they, if you're able to. Um, a hint that they don't want to speak to you is if you've looked all over their website with a magnifying glass and you cannot find the name of that program officer or their email or their phone number, then uh, they're probably looking for you just to send it in through their regular system. But a lot of places would like you to pitch the project. Um, Believe it or not, I'm a shy person. I love to pitch via email, um, but if you're bolder than me, I believe that there's really value in pitching by phone. Um, and especially if that's your best way of interacting to show your passion is by phone, by all means, pick up the phone and call them. That, that if we can move on. Yes. And we didn't say this, but we don't have any uh, breaks in this um, 2.5 uh, marathon Zoom session. Um, and so we really want you to, to take breaks whenever you feel you need to um, because we're recording this and because we're also going to give you a copy of the PowerPoint with all the links and all the information. You know, don't feel like you have uh, lose anything um, taking a break. So we're going to go right here to writing tips. And um, 
you know, once again, I kind of talked about this earlier. You really want to craft your answer around um, each question. If there's subparts in the question, then I will highlight and bullet the subpart. Sometimes they give you an, a tiny, tiny, tiny little space to write in, you know, like they give you 150 words or something like that. Um, I may not repeat the question verbatim, but I make it so that they will understand this is my response to your question. So maybe they had a question that had three sentences about the program description. I may break that out um, and, you know, just have a little phrase so they can ad identify each one of their sections. I don't use a lot of abbreviations. Um, sometimes you need to because your name is really, really long. Um, you know, so if you were Goodwill, Goodwill, Easter Seals of Miami Valley, I'm probably killing your name and getting it out of organization. But, you know, you may not want to write that each time. But Try to remember your re reviewers may be tired. They may have a pile of applications, so they may forget your abbreviations. Um, so if I'm using abbreviations, I will often repeat the official wording um, on every page. Um, I've uh, done peer reviews on federal grants, and I have found that three quarters of the way through the grant, I'm like, well, wait. What's the name of this organization? I see the abbreviation. I can no longer remember what was the name of the organization. That may have something to do with being 66. Um, but hey, um, use the terms that they use in the RFP. So if they're using um, particular uh, descriptions, um, like... Um, the Department of uh, Mental Health would refer to uh, people as being seriously mentally ill. And HUD used to, I don't know if they still do, but they used to refer to him as a more derogatory, chronically mentally ill. Um, you wanted to use HUD's definition um, and their words um, or find some way of, of uh, cross-referencing it. Um, don't use slang or, you know, it's pre-academic writing. Um, try to use the name of the organization rather than we all the time. But once again, if your spacing's tight, you know, I sometimes say we simply because, you know, it's very few abbreviations that are just two uh, characters. Uh, so there's always the exception to that. Uh, I always try to write down a list of task dates, who's responsible. The work is always going to take uh, longer than you expect. If you ask for letters of support or commitment from organizations, pretty much you can bank that if you ask for them back uh, noon on uh, December 10th, that you only have uh, a few of them on the December 10th at noon and that you're gonna have to, to nag. So set up all your guidelines around building in that communication back and forth uh, to remind people. Um, everybody's busy, so when you have partners, they may have said, oh, well, we'll write this section of the grant. You know, you need to build them in early enough so that if something comes up, um, and they're not going to be able to write it, you still have time to write it yourself. Um, so it always takes longer than you think. Um, I always try to write in the active tense. Um, you know, there's nothing really wrong with writing in a passive uh, way except it ends up sounding very bureaucratic. And so I don't know if you can see this. It may just be really large on my screen, but half of this could cut off my screen. How does it look, Alex? It, it's a little cut off. Okay. Okay. So uh, the housing program director will recruit and hire outreach specialists and a case manager by June 2024. So that's an example of an active sentence. Uh, 
a weaker sentence is an outrage. Uh, specialists and case manager will be recruited and hired. Uh, just because it doesn't say who's doing that. When you say who's doing it, it just sounds more affirming. It's better to use we will rather than we would. Um, anything that makes it sound uh, present and actionable um, is very good. You don't have to have every sentence uh, like that. You'll drive yourself crazy. Um, but, you know, to the extent that you can do that, that would be wonderful. Um, when you're looking at grants, you always want to make sure, am I going after something that's really going to help my organization um, in the long term? Because you can chase money and then find out that's too hard to implement. Or even now, the governments, uh, you know, when you fail to implement well, they may rate you as a high-risk grantee. Uh, which means that you have a mark against you on future applications. Uh, so be very uh, careful that you don't respond to grants that are beyond your skill sets or your goals. Um, or find a partner who can help you, a consultant that can help you, or get some technical assistance uh, going in and realize that you're going to have to really, um, you know, build up. Okay, um, and we're gonna go on to the next screen and I'm in the chat, so I can't go on to the next screen. It's not going to the next screen. There it is. So writing the abstract and now I'm gonna turn it over um, to Alex and Alex is gonna describe being writing abstracts because she has lots of experience with academic abstracts. All right, thank you. Uh, can you move over to the next slide? It'll have all of the descriptions of everything. Um, so with an abstract, whenever you read like a research paper or you see a news article, most of the information that's being pulled from it is in the abstract. The abstract is the initial summary that pulls in the reader. In, in a, a grant setting, it's going to be incredibly important because this is their first introduction with understanding your whole goal in and out. So, of course, I don't have a lot of experience with specific grant writing abstracts. Of course, Amy does. But just in general, like it is kind of like if you were trying to summarize a book in one page, like you need to make sure you have all of your key important information, specifically for the grant writing process, you want to make sure you describe who you are and your partners. Um, can you go back to this? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, you want to describe who you are and your partners. Um, you want to describe why your project is important, what are the needs of it, and also to give a brief overview of your needs. Um, you really want to hone in on who will benefit from your program. Like Amy said earlier, there are some specific ones that are designated for families, children, etc. So you want to make sure you um, specifically highlight who will benefit. Um, you also want to, of course, specify what you're trying to do, give an overview of what you will use the grant money for and how your program is set up. Uh, give a kind of, you will go into a lot more detail um, in the timeline, but you still want to give a how you will end up executing this, when and where, details that you can fit within the abstract. Again, Amy was kind of honing in on there might be a character limit. So sometimes you will have to decide what is important and what isn't. Um, you always want to give your expectations for your results, what outcomes that your clients or the communities will have, and really try to include numbers. If I just say, oh, I think that this is going to be increased, nobody knows exactly what that means. But if you say, based off of our research, we're planning on increasing the number of trash cans in the park by 30% or something like that, it gives them an opportunity to understand where your goal is and where their money is going to be contributed. And then, of course, you're going to have to give how much it'll cost. Um, and then also looking at this will tie into your request in the total budget. So you kind of have to have all of that groundwork laid out before you're able to write the abstract and the summary or abstract or summary. Thanks, Alex. 
Um, and that's a wonderful description of abstracts. And, and you'll see in our samples, we've got um, different kinds of abstracts that you can, uh, you know, use. Um, writing a needs a statement. Um, why is this project important? I always spend a lot of time on uh, writing the needs assessments. It's often one of the early um, parts of the application. And I really like to set it up that I have done more research than other grant writers. Um, so that's been the key to success is really being willing to push the envelope a little in terms of the amount of information that you'll bring to the grant. Um, so is there um, a need in the community? Um, what is the census data? Do you have waiting lists? Um, do you have crime, health, education stats? Um, keep it local if possible. You know, so you really don't want to write uh, a grant for the city of Dayton and just talk about how crime is raising or, or is has risen as a nation. You know, you really want to, to look at what's local. Um, we've put together a Google site. I don't know if everyone has gone to our Google site, but we're going to be sharing that uh, with you. We have tons and tons of information. We have community plans. We have um, hospital needs assessments. Um, we have all the city of Dayton's plans. We have strategic plans for like public health and their needs assessment. Um, we have all sorts of different sites that, um, you know, can help you uh, find data and use that data. Um, we're also very um, pleased to do that with you in that informal Saturday meeting, or you can just email us and say, I'm having trouble uh, finding uh, information. One of the things that we are doing is sending you to the censusreporter.org uh, uh, for census data because it's so much user more user-friendly than the actual um, census site, and it was a project done between journalists and the U.S. Census Bureau, and so they they must like journalists because they made it a lot easier than for the rest of us using their main site. Um, so these are all resources for you. Um, so here's the, the website, and, you know, you can tap on this link, um, and it will take you to the site. I'm going to stop uh, the share and uh, take you to the, to the uh, site, hopefully. Okay, so I'm ready to share again. Hold on just a second. It'd be nice if they're sharing in Zoom would just follow you. You can have know. that. We can like share a screen. Yeah. Okay. It's all <laughs> well, Alex may help me out here. By the end of the meeting, I may know be better how to do this without stopping in and sharing. Uh, but here's the urban research initiatives. Um, and here is, if you go up to open data, we have uh, school data. Um, you know, so anytime I'm talking about kids, I actually use uh, school data. And so I can type in Dayton Public Schools or an individual school building or Trout Woods buildings and get their data. We've got stuff from uh, 211, which is United Way. Um, I'm going to get this caption out of my way so I can click on the other box. You can go to uh, plans, and this is where we have all the, the plans and studies. If you know of a plan out there that we don't have, uh, please let us know because we would be happy to add on. Um, so we want this to be an ongoing list of resources that you can borrow from, or um, somebody said once, uh, great, um, good poets borrow, great poets steal. So 
feel free. These are all public plans. You can um, steal information and cite the plan. They'll be very happy. Um, you know, so we've got stuff from the Animus Board, a lot of different resources. Okay. And I'm going to stop here and go back. So I'm doing the 66-year-old version of this. And, uh, um, you know, um, Alex is, is doing the, you know, uh, how old are you? Uh, 22. 22-year-old version of this. So, so her version is a lot cleaner. Um, so are you guys seeing the uh, slide now? Okay. When you're 66, you should feel good that we are uh, even able to uh, turn on the computer. Alex is going to explain a little bit about the importance of citations. Yeah, so with citations, that gives you credibility. You don't want to just put in your information. Okay, sorry. Um, so you wanna make sure that you have all of your sources correctly cited. Something that Amy and I were talking about is that if let's just say you do have that letter crunch and you can't fit in full sources at the end, it still is important to put in text citations. Um, the citations I'm assuming should be in APA, but I feel as if as long as you keep your citations consistent throughout your entire paper, you should be okay. Do you have any opinion on that, Amy? Yeah, really. Um, if you know the citations used by your particular industry, use those. Uh, like a education uses APA a lot. Um, and nobody's really going to take points off for not having your citations perfect. Um, so anything that's close to this is uh, acceptable. This is probably not even an APA. This may be Chicago, um, except for the Na National Science Foundation, or if you're specifically looking for research money, uh, they will take off points for your citations not being uh, appropriate for the specific, uh, you know, tie Chicago, MLA, APA. Go ahead. Um, so there is a lot of resources online. I know personally throughout college, high school, I do not remember all the specifics of what to italicize, where to put the periods, etc. So there's a lot of resources online like EasyBib or um, like other various like citation machines. You always want to check after though, because every once in a while it might pull it incorrectly. If you pull any of your data off of um, academic sites, usually like EBSCOhost and other library approved websites, they will have a preset of citations that you are allowed to use. And also you can get in-text citations. So you always want to make sure you know how to do both. And if you don't, just Google it because I'm going to be honest, I've been writing academic papers my whole life, and I still don't really know the difference between everything. I just Google it every time I'm about to write a paper. So make sure you have the, the citations there because it does give you credibility. It allows your reader to accurately be able to look back at your data and confirm that what you were saying is correct, and it'll further improve what it is that you're trying to get out of your grant because it just shows even in the in initial steps of applying, you have put in more effort and more thought into showing your resources. That's wonderful. Thank you, Alex. And the other thing is, if you don't have enough room to do a full citation, you may be able to put it in the appendices or you may just do an in-text citation. So, you know, you could have cited this as ANDA um, et al. and and then the, the year. Um, so that'd be an option for you. So this just provides more information on, on that. Alex really kind of covered that already. Um, so the in-text citation may be name of author and year, or you may use, um, you know, like footnotes um, at the end of the page. So whenever you're describing uh, needs, 
I think there's real benefits to also saying what's right in your community. Um, so, you know, um, are you, do you have faith-based organizations involved, mosques, churches, synagogues, you know, community neighborhood groups, you know, um, are the, the police involved? Are they working on addressing issues with you about community policing? Are they, you know, open to, to addressing concerns? You know, do you have city, county funding? What's your agencies are participating in? Um, who are your citizens, groups, volunteers, other investments, housing? Um, you know, we've uh, gotten a lot of leverage out of the fact that um, the um, Dayton Public Schools has built uh, new skill buildings, you know, from 2008 until I guess they finished their last ones. I can't remember exactly when, um, but we actually go and describe how much money was in each school building. So when uh, we got an $8 million grant from Blue Meridian Partners, we said we were talking about, we did that in Northwest uh, Dayton, and we did it again when we got the $26 million helping Omega. Omega was writing the grant. I was just one of the team. Um, but we would list how much that school uh, building costs, how much the library costs. Uh, Omega CDC had uh, put together a new Hope Center um, that was either 11 or 30 million. Um, and then they had a housing project. So one of them's 11 million, one of them was 30 million. We cite each one of those as being an investment in the area. So this is just a, a, a good example. You really want to hit all of your assets, what are your business assets? Are they growing? Are your corporations involved? You know, um, those are all things that I would say in the needs assessment, even if they don't ask that, even if they just say, tell us about the target population or the community, I always squeeze in assets. Um, and I think that's one of the big reasons uh, Blue Meridian is a huge foundation. It's a, sort of a foundation of foundations. So they've got Bill and Melinda Gates grants, Duke money, um, a ton of different money. They would have never looked at us without that huge support that we were pulling from a lot of different sectors that invested, including all the work the city of Dayton was putting in with the ARPA. Okay, we are at uh, Jamboard time. All righty, everybody. I just posted a link in the chat that'll take you to a Jamboard. Um, and I know, Amy, do you want to open it and we can show at least like the, we want everybody to use the sticky note feature. Um, so yeah, there should be the link. I can make sure the screen sharing works. Do do do. I'm a marathon runner, I'm here. You can just click screen. Okay, never mind. Okay. Um, Okay, I'm going to do that. I should be clicking screen rather than, so let me go back here. Oh, well, never mind. We'll do it the next time. I'll get it right the next time. You want to go back on the jam board. Uh, yeah, which is there. You know, and yeah. Okay. okay. So are, is everybody on the jam board? You can nod. Lauren, I see you nodding. So, so uh, with the jam board, what you do is you put a little sticky note. And what we're asking you guys to do is think of sources of uh, information that you might want to cite for your project. Um, so I'm thinking of our USDA project. And I'm going to um, food deserts would be my source. So, so this is all sorts of different. Uh, so people uh, jump in and then you'll find you have to drag your uh, note over there. So as many different sources as you can think for your different grant, uh, add them with sticky notes and we'll go ahead and go. Mm -hmm. 
I feel like we should have theme music. I would sing to help the time go along, but you guys would actively leave the Zoom meeting if I did that. So we're just gonna all enjoy the lovely silence. So that way you guys don't have to hear me sing. I can guarantee that I can sing worse than, than Alex can. Maybe we'll harmonize together <laughs> in, in our singing. So yeah, I already see a lot of really amazing, like looking at the existing resources we've given with the Urban Research Initiative website, looking at the Five River Metro Park sites, looking at the census data, um, looking at the, the various information that Amy gave on being able to look at data from schools and education with graduation rates. Um, something I put down. If you do use an academic article, make sure you put peer reviewed. That's just an extra step of other people agree with this and other professionals have a, had said, okay, yes, this is right. So if you use a, um, an academic site like EBSCOhost, make sure it's peer reviewed. Um, using Purdue OWL. I do love Purdue OWL. That's I love Purdue resource. OWL. Um, wow, there's a lot of amazing things. And it looks like someone even put in a link. I love it. All right, we'll still give it another couple minutes just in, or another minute or two, just in case, you know, you got to think of one because I know it is hard. But but yeah, there's a lot of really amazing resources out there and different sources that you'll want to use based off of your your grants and what exactly is your end goal. And don't hesitate to send us an email after school data. Yes. Um, you know, if you have a source that you can't find, um, that's what we're here for. Um, the uh, Our uh, anonymous donor who is no longer anonymous is uh, Tim and Mary Reardon set up the Urban Research Initiative specifically to help uh, this kind of work. Alrighty, I did just space some of them out. So if your sticky note just flew into a different direction, that was me. Okay. There we go. Jam more time. Okay, so program description, and uh, I don't know, uh, because there were still dinosaurs when I was in uh, high school, um, but our uh, teachers used to, uh, you know, in between when we were feeding students to the dinosaurs, uh, used to talk about how, who, when, where, what, um, so, and I had a, a, a college student actually write out how, who, when, where, why. You really don't want to do that, but you want to highlight, you know, staffing, you know, so that would be the who, you know. So, you know, this is where you describe all the different things that um, are important to implement with your project. You know, what's the staffing? What services will be offered? Um, you, you know, are you um, already staffed up or do you need to hire people? You know, what's your recruitment process? You know, some of these are the questions they use, what services will be offered, describe your purposes for our funds, how will our funds be used? Those questions are all asking who, what, when, where. Um, and you want your program description to go back to your needs assessment. You know, so if you said that you're um, addressing, you know, trauma, um, you're addressing um, child abuse, or um, you're addressing uh, structural uh, racial um, discrimination and disparities in your community, then you would want to show by the staff that you hire, that they're representative of the community or because of the kind of training they've gotten in trauma um, or the kind of credentials that they have, that they're addressing all the needs that you talked about. Um, so you want to say where the services are offered, who, um, when, and we're going to talk more about when and uh, Alex is going to talk up to us about timelines. So who's providing these services? Are they art performers, librarians, university staff, um, healthcare, 
professionals? Is there specific training needed for the uh, project? Um, so when is that training occurring? Um, you know, so those are all key points. The other thing is, and this has been uh, a big issue really for the last 20 years, um, is what's the research basis for your program? So there's a lot of dissatisfaction that funders have that they have spent billions of dollars, literally billions of dollars, on programming, but they feel like maybe it hasn't really changed things. Um, so now a lot of them are saying, don't just describe an innovative idea. Say why it's going to work in the community. And one of the best ways of being able to say why it's going to work in the community is to be able to cite the research uh, basis for this. Um, so has it worked in other communities? Um, when they talk in education or health, um, they're usually talking about a strong evidence-based practice where there's been randomized control trials um, with positive results and no negative results. Every federal agency and state agency is going to define this a little bit different. Um, there is no consistent understanding um, about what exactly makes a strong uh, research. Uh, so you kind of have to find out what is the um, organization that you're writing for using, like the U.S. Yeah, Department of Education. Got it, yeah. Uh, so the U.S. Uh, Department of Education uses really, really stringent, um, you know, they want to see randomized control trials and they want to see trials with, where there was um, not a lot of study participants dropping out. They want to see that it geographically or by population uh, meets your um, community that you're proposing. So those are just kind of the things. We've got a database that we're going to give to you. Um, and when you click on this database, it will give you for um, health and education and social services and child services. This will give you evidence basis. Um, and so they can show you the clearinghouse and uh, that will take you to the studies that will allow you to defend why your project's going to work. So what if you're doing something that nobody else has done? Um, so it can be truly innovative. There's a risk to that. But what you want to do then is say, why is this a tweak on what's worked previously? Why is this innovation important? What was the past research? What's your thinking behind it? That's called level four, um, which is that you can cite a rationale for it. So the levels of evidence are strong evidence. Moderate evidence means maybe there's a study, but it's not a, not a real strong study. Um, promising evidence, there is some evidence, but, you know, maybe it's not a randomized control trial, um, you know. And luckily for us, each one of these clearing houses has their own PhDs uh, that are going to study the studies and they're going to tell you whether they think they're strong, moderate, promising, or there's a rationale for it. And so you you simply cite what that clearinghouse has rated the, the study by. But that makes a huge difference. There, I mean, once again, Omega CDC's work where they got the $28 million in um, money from the, the um, Department of Education, we would not have been able to write that grant if we were not able to cite all this academic research that declared why their project was using best practices and, and was built on research. It was a big part of the points. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, the work plan and timeline, and I'm going to try not to mute myself because that'll cause problems for Alex. Take it away. 
All right. So work plans and timelines. It's actually a very technical process if, if you want to make it more advanced, but at the bare minimum, I can describe some helpful tips and just some ways that you should format your work plan and timeline. So something that always needs to be put down is as much detail as you can put down, which kind of sounds intuitive, but you always want to make sure you have task headings, um, break up your timeline into large sections. So that way it doesn't seem too too heavy. Um, and then of course your subtasks are the actual individual tasks that you have to put down to get done. One thing that I know Amy mentioned earlier, um, can go back. Um, one thing that Amy mentioned earlier is that you really want to put in a lot of cushion room, especially if you're working with a lot of different organizations, a lot of different people, everything's kind of coming in at once. What they see their deadline as is as something that can kind of be pushed. So for your timeline, you want to make sure you put an adequate time for people to get things done and maybe even say, hey, I need this back to me by the 15th, but schedule it on your timeline to be done by the 17th. That way there is a little bit of leeway and it doesn't mess you up if other people if their contributions are a little bit delayed. Um, you always wanna make sure that there is a person responsible on it. One thing that's difficult is you put down a bunch of tasks and you have a whole group of people and you're like, okay, well, who wants to do what? You always wanna make sure every single task at least has someone responsible to um, organize it and make sure it gets completed. And a good um, practice is to put in resources um, next to whoever is responsible. If you have a drive, if you have anything like your research papers, any um, document or, or place where you can store everything, it would be really great to have those resources. And one of the main points of creating a timeline is to have start and finish dates. I have, which I can put into the shared drive that you guys will have access to, many examples of this to where you can show physical like calendar examples of where things line up. But with start and finish dates, you want to make sure whatever overlaps is something that is feasible to be overlapped. I know in previous sections like the abstract slash summary, there was parts talking about how your timeline was going to be laid out. So this is something that needs to be done in tangent with research and planning for the way that you write it. Because if you do get this approved, this is a timeline that's going to have to be enacted the second that you're able to start it. So having something concrete down will be super beneficial. Um, so something that um, I know Amy was kind of talking about is there's so many different levels of key staff. You want to make sure you know exactly who is going to be involved, any staff member, any materials, any training. You're going to have to make sure you lay out everything pretty detailed wise. I know sometimes that can be stressful, but that's why it's super important to have large groups and then subtasks. That way you can kind of put all training down below and maybe uh resources with other departments in one section. That way it becomes a little bit easier for you to process and to work through because just listing down every single task all in one sometimes can get really confusing and really difficult. And you want to make sure that even if you have someone that's heading up that specific task, that you still include anybody else that they might need to be in communication with. That's something that can be customized per group or area. I know in previous research groups that I've been a part of, we use something called a Gantt chart or a Gantt chart, however you say it. And we put down a task leader and that task leader was in charge of figuring out who else they needed to communicate with. So it's really up to your own discretion how you describe it. But I recommend using Excel, Google Sheets, writing it down on a big piece of paper, a whiteboard, something that is um, digestible for you. I know not everybody enjoys using Excel or Google Sheets. So whatever it is that you find easy for you to comprehend will be super important. Move on to the next one. Um, so this is an example, I know Amy can probably speak more about this, of um, a timeline I'm assuming that was put into a grant proposal yes but yeah it it oh uh, you want to definitely be detailed especially because if you say um for one of the tasks talk to amy about this when you go to actually put it in your grant they're not going to know necessarily who amy is they're not going to know any abbreviations so with this kind of timeline layout definitely having all details is important 
for your own personal timeline, if you and your team know certain abbreviations, certain, oh, we have to go talk to this person about this. Like it, you just want to make sure that when you put it in an official setting, that everything is laid out so that a stranger who knows nothing about your organization other than what you've given them can follow your timeline and see if it's feasible. All right, so we're going to have another five minute or so review question time. So please start writing any questions you've had in the chat and we'll go through them. But also don't worry, we're still going to have another section for questions after program outcomes and like any additional time at the end for questions. Uh, so let me get a little, little lapper thing going. All right. But yeah, I know this definitely has seemed like a lot, but thank you guys for uh for sticking around and listening. And we do actually have um like a few different other interactive things that we're going to be putting you guys through. So bear with us. All right. I'll give everyone a second to write because I know sometimes writing questions is hard. Or if you want to unmute yourself and ask it verbally, that's fine too. We won't bite. I mean, after all, I've made enough bungles in this training to make anybody feel comfortable. <laughs> So do, we don't have any sacrificial lambs for the questions. <laughs> I'll ask her a quick question, Amy. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, does, I know it, it varies greatly on the grants that you work on in terms of size, but do you have a kind of um, go-to amount of time in your head when you're kind of start to finish looking for grant funding, thinking about how long it's going to take you to put the whole thing together? Uh, to meet a deadline um, in terms of writing, gathering? I mean, is there a kind of minimum six months in your head or, uh, you know, how far are you looking out? Because some of these grants that I'm helping and looking at, um, you know, they'll release them only so far in advance or, you know, and I'm always curious as to how that plays into your timeline when you're juggling things. Um, really depends upon how much pre-work I have uh, done. Um, so I would say in general for a federal grant, you're going to need at least six weeks. And that means that you've already, uh, gotten a fair amount of ideas about, you know, it's, you're not starting at zero. Um, it would be very hard to write a, a federal grant in less than six weeks. I have done it. But it usually means that you're then doing all-nighters uh, the entire last week of the grant. Um, smaller foundation grants, I, I actually have to tell you that my daughter wins the prize for that. My daughter's in her 40s. Uh, she wrote a, a grant from beginning to end in 45 minutes and sent it off to a local foundation. Uh, she had just found out it was due that day, and she emailed the, the person, and by the time they emailed her back and said, you can have an extension, she had already written the grant. By the way, but she was running for the Olympics. She had written, you know, a lot before, and everything was ready. You know, it was really just like kind and pasting. I would say... Um, for uh, uh, a county or local funder, um, you know, a week would probably do it. State grant, probably a couple of weeks. Um, the federal grants are, are just a little bit harder. Um, mainly not because of the questions, just the, just the ruthless competition. <laughs> Any more questions? They just want us to get done and get yeah. off the screen. Yeah, <laughs> we get it. We understand this is long. All right, we can keep on going. No, I think I have the next section as well. Okay, so let me, sometimes it just gets stalled here. Okay, it's program outcomes and evaluation. All right. Go, Alex. Um, so you can probably move on to the next slide as well. So something about with, Program outcomes and evaluations, you really want to show 
why your programs are going to lead to positive change. So you can't just say, oh, this is such an amazing program. See, it's clearly very self-explanatory. You want to kind of lay that out for the people that you're writing this grant for solely because like one, they might be able to understand it, but they are going to be reading so many different grants that it's important that you highlight the differences for yours and why your program is actually going to bring in positive change, going to bring in positive resources, or at least complete the goal that you are planning on, which can also be hinted in a little bit at like what you put your research in for. Um, so I know um, Amy made this slide for vocabulary for evaluation 101. Um, so you want to make sure, like, we will be sharing this PowerPoint, so you don't necessarily have to write this down, this down. but if you look at just goals, um, they need to be broad, often long-term, and aim for a project or a program, and sometimes they can't really be measurable. Um, long-term outcomes might not be thought of goals in a logic model. I don't think we went over a logic model, but there are resources in the drive uh, for what a logic model is. Uh, so yeah, this is just a, a sample goal. Asthma is no longer the number one reason that children miss school. Something very simple like that. Do you have any other comments on it? No, no. And and what they're primarily looking for is um, client, community, individual-centered outcomes rather than process outcomes. It's taking me a second here to get to advance. That's all good. Um, something that I know I've heard all throughout academia is SMART objectives. This is a very simple acronym that can help you figure out what exactly is the best way to portray your goal and to let whoever it is that's reading it know all of the things that you need. Uh, I think uh, Amy is answering this, but yes, we will be able to share this recording with you guys, so no worries. Uh, but you want to make sure that your goal is very specific. Um, you don't want it to be super broad, especially since you're asking for thousands of dollars of money, more than likely. So you want to make sure it's very specific. You want to make sure that you're able to show results. Hence, you want it to be able to be measurable and achievable. Um, this will allow whoever is reading your proposal to say, oh, okay, this makes sense. I see why they're requesting this amount of money for this type of goal. They don't want it to be too outlandish or we don't see that this is feasible. Um, you also want to make sure it's relevant. You want to make sure whatever issue it is that you are proposing to solve or whatever organization that you're proposing to help with, it actually makes sense for you to be putting money towards that. So it's really important, work with your group and your organizations to figure out what goal exactly are you targeting? Is this something that's feasible, something we can show results for? And is this something that the community actually needs? Um, one other thing is that you wanna make sure you put in some designated time range. If I just say like, oh, one day I'm gonna make a million dollars. You don't really know how long that's gonna take. You don't know if it's even achievable. You don't know if I have any steps for it, but in examples that we're gonna show, as long as you show some sort of time frame, or we would like to have this done by X, Y, Z dates, um, it'll help whoever is reading this to understand that you yourself have a plan and you have a deadline that you made for yourself. Okay, it's taking a second here. I'm warming up the hamster. I'm asking him to move. <laughs> um, so I know this is an example that um, Amy already had, but this is an example of something that uses the SMART goal pretty well. Um, so I can I can read it off for everybody. Of the projected 104 persons that complete the date and job training program and complete the welding certificate, 80%, 83 persons will find a job within 30 days of graduation and will maintain that job for at least six months. So as you can kind of tell, um, as you look at it, it shows different aspects of the SMART goal. It's something that's very specific. Uh, it's something that is measurable because of the percentage and the amount of people. Um, it is attainable. Um, it is 
he it is relevant because of the fact that this is very important to the Dayton job training program. And it is something that is time sensitive. So you can look that it says keeping in like finding a job within 30 days and also maintaining it for at least six months. Of course, this is kind of just pulled out of the hat. Like there would be a lot of other research and an entire um, abstract and need statement, and everything that would go with this. But it is something you want to make sure your goal lays out the different steps. The hamster is very tired. <laughs> um, so um, there's something called, I think I call it like the PADAC, um, but there's the plan, do, check, and act. It's just a good kind of flow to make sure that you are on track for what it is that you're creating for your goal. You want to make sure you recognize an opportunity and plan a change. You want to test the change and carry out small studies to help support your goals. Um, you want to check you want to review your tests, analyze your results, and identify anything that you've learned. And then you want to take action on what you've learned and make sure that this can be applied to your goal. So this is just a, a flow example of if you're having any issues with how to um, refine your goal and how to continue through testing and to prove to your, um, your source that you're writing the grant for that this is an actual program or goal that can be executed. This is just a good way kind of to filter through your thoughts and make sure you're going through a scientific process. Yep. Once again, I'm rubbing the hamster's little back saying, turn, turn. <laughs> um, so this just kind of goes into the PDAC and always making sure that you want your your goal to have continuously improving results and to have your services improve as well. And it also goes into who you will share your evaluation with and how that it very is so customizable to your organization. But again, this is just a resource you can use to help uh, fuel your thought process and to continue through and make sure you show real results. And I want to highlight one of the reasons why we're uh emphasizing this, um, a lot of people are not using their evaluation results. They're waiting to the end of the year um, or even the, to the end of the grant, and then they're looking at their data. You want to look at data every month. Uh, you know, sometimes when you're talking about things like children's school attendance, you want to be looking at that almost every day or every week. Um, and you want to get data into the hands of the people that are actually going to be making the changes. And you want to brainstorm with them. And you also want to brainstorm with the students. So why aren't they motivated to do well in, um, you know, these benchmark tasks? Well, they feel bored. They feel you know, uh, they they're they're um, you know frustrated with the testing process. They may not understand the testing process. Um, you know, unfortunately, testing has become a way that we're inadvertently redlining our schools. Um, you know, so you know, children of a certain age can recognize that the impact of how well they do on these state tests ripples over into property values and everything else about the community. Uh, we had one group of students that wanted to ma march on the governor's office to explain their perception of how these tests were uh, affecting them. So, you know, your students, your mothers, your fathers, your, you know, people who are returning to the community, you know, um, they have a voice in your evaluation. You need to share that voice and so that they can tell you, this is why it's not working. Who knows better? They know best why your programs might need to be strengthened. So organizational experience, um, I don't know why my hamster is so, so slow today. 
Funders will typically ask about your mission services and the purposes of the organization. And that's pretty easy. I mean, you, you can get that from your agency's website or your Facebook page if you're a neighborhood organization. Um, but the other thing that, that you want to hit is why are you the best organization to get this money? And when you're talking about national money, you know, maybe there's only going to be four funded, you know, in the United States. So why are you the best organization? That really needs to come across. So you really need to describe, you know, what's your niche? Are you a uh, Black-led organization? That should give you immediate um, lived experience. Are you grassroots? Are you connected really close to the community? Um, are you an academic organization? So what's, you know, your history there? What makes you unique as a college? You know, why are your past successes? Why are your partners past successes? Um, what are the strengths of your key staff, your program, your executive director? Don't um, don't discount your fiscal director. If your fiscal director has a CPA or, you know, has extensive experience, or maybe you don't even have a fiscal director, but you have someone who's on your board who ha is your treasurer and he has good business experience. Um, you know, once again, you know, you want to figure out who they want to fund and then explain why you are that person. They, your organization is that person. Your community is that person. Um, you know, those are all really, really key things to do. And that's where academic partners, I, this is not polite to say, but we drag UD and Wright State and Sinclair into grants all the time because those PhDs help. You know, and um, in response, the universities like to drag the community in the grants they're writing for the exact same reason, having those relationships and partnerships in the community sell grant applications. So it's a trade-off. You know, the universities need the community and the community needs the universities. We all need the city and county. Um, you know, so... If you're a tiny agency, discuss the assets of your board. Um, we got funding um, from Miami Valley Housing Opportunities. Um, so I worked on founding that years, million years ago. We got it entirely on the basis of the Adamus board's records. You know, so, so, you know, you can definitely pull out your partners and use their assets when you feel like maybe you don't. Once again, if you're grassroots, that's a lot of what a lot of organizations or funders are looking for. Uh, to a certain extent, they're tired of funding the same entities. Um, there's a real resolution, a re res recognition um, that um, white-led agencies, larger agencies, older agencies have gotten a disproportionate amount of funding. Um, and so I think there's funders out there that are trying to correct that. Okay. And here's an example. Uh, Five Rivers began a, a pilot program uh, with infant mortality, and they were able to serve. This was their centering pregnancy uh, program. They were able to serve more than 400 uh, pregnant women without losing a single infant in that first pilot year. So it's always important to you know, squeeze in, and sometimes you do have to squeeze it in if there's not enough characters and spaces. You want to squeeze in what your successes are. Don't be shy. This is the time to uh, brag on yourself and your agency. Oh, please, hamster. Please, hamster. There. 
Okay, once again, I already said this, but funders want collaboration. When you're writing about your organization, describe the niche that you fit into in the community. Who are you collaborating with? You need to describe who are your competitors and why they offer something different um, than what you offer and why you guys are talking together, planning together, working on things together. If you're not planning and working on things together, start. Um, so a lot of competitors have come around the table and gotten grants together that none of them could have gotten on their own. Um, so, you know, what's your capacity? What are your strengths? Um, those are all very, very important things to do. And now we're ready for the part that's going to keep you on your pins and needles. Uh, what's the budget and uh, budget justification? Yeah, so we're going to talk a little bit um, about uh, the budget, um, and then we're going to put you in uh, breakout rooms and have you uh, discuss um, options uh, for your budget. Um, so um, personnel, you know, are your expenses with personnel as a part-time, full-time? A lot of times people refer to personnel as full-time equivalents, which always means in the, the um, words of that term that they're working 40 hours a week or 2,080 hours. Um, and sometimes at universities or, or county governments, actually like 37 hours, but you know, in general, the work week is thought of as uh, 2080. You know, so this uh, little sheet here uh, shows that we have a program director uh, who's working 52 hours a week. Their hourly wage is 18.7. Uh, this is actually an old one, so that's not a very nice wage. Um, I'd say that was a pre-pandemic example. Um, and it actually was. Um, and they were uh, making uh, 38,000. Uh, so this is an after-school example. We had lead teachers um, and they were uh, making $20 an hour pre-pandemic. Um, I gotta get rid of this chat thing. It's in my way. You know, so it goes through the list here. You can see what each individual um, is making. Um, and so this provides them with a lot of information um, that so that they understand the characteristics of your program. Um, we have uh, budget benefits. Um, so we have, um, we're breaking it up. We're saying 29% um, of salary includes health insurance workers, uh, comp, unemployment, FICA. Um, a lot of times if you have part-time staff and they have no benefits at all, that's, uh, you usually have a benefit package of around 13%. Uh, because you're still doing payroll payments or taxes, like workers' comp, unemployment, FICA. Um, so those are examples. If you can pull um, from your budget, know those exact amounts, that's always uh, beneficial. You know, so what's your uh, furniture? Um, if I was going to strengthen this a little bit in the narrative, I would have a cost for the bookcase, a cost for the cabinet, cost for the desk here. How would I get those costs if I was writing a grant at the last minute and couldn't get those uh, directly from the finance person internally? I would look um, online and I would get three costs and I would take the average. Um, so I spend a lot of time online, um, you know, look at furniture costs, you know, what's uh, boss rental, you know, those kind of things. 
Um, so, you know, if you don't have a way of getting that internally, uh, Google is your friend. Uh, professional development, you know, so once again, in this budget example, I've actually tried to marry um, the um, type of, of training to a description of the training. So this is almost a budget narrative and a budget joined together. Your funder may want it differently. So, you know, a lot of times they'll want it in a narrative and then other times they, they want it in the same form. Uh -huh. So this just gives you di different descriptions. So this was what focus math was costing uh, pre-pandemic when we wrote this. You know, we had uh, cost per student. Um, in the actual application, and I show you an application from Cleveland, and I didn't write it, but it's a good application um, in your example. Um, a lot of times I will actually um, compare what's in the description in the narrative um, to the actual objectives. So, you know, where I say focus math, then I would have said, here's my uh, math objective and cite the number of that objective. Um, and that's something the Ohio Department of Education really loves. Um, here's our contracts. Um, you know, so we um, we typically work with uh, Richard Stock, um, who's our uh, evaluator. Um, and so he had given us a, a current price um, and that was, you know, the yearly price for that particular uh, project. Um, and we actually had to have, Dayton Public Schools had to have a bidding process. So we listed the last two people that have won the bids and their credentials um, and then explained there would be a bidding process. So we fat, we covered the legal um, issues of Dayton Public by saying there was going to be a bidding process, but we won the points of being able to give the actual credentials of the two individuals who had worked previously for us. Um, here's indirect and administration. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on uh, discussing how to calculate indirect um, because it would be a week-long course all of its own. Everybody does it differently. The universities do it very differently than uh, a school district. Um, school districts have much more complicated ways where they um, cost everything back to a particular building and program. So they have often extremely low um, indirect costs of like maybe, you know, 2%. Yeah, Lauren, you liked it. You made that face. Yes, really, just because of the way they calculate it's so different. So you're comparing apples and oranges. Um, so, you know, if you guys need help, um, most of the time, unless you have a very specific way of doing indirect, you probably need to weigh and then negotiate that with your federal agency. Um, rather than citing one in the, the proposal. Um, you know, and if you get in um, a bind with that, you know, we can talk more about that. Um, we have uh, revenues, um, you know, so most of the time foundation grants will want to know who has this funding proposal been submitted to? So they would prefer that they're not the only dollar. Um, like Matil Family Foundation would like to be 10% or less of the total uh, funding project. Don't quote me on that because that varies. Um, but, um, you know, a lot of foundations would like to only be a percent of the project. So they'll ask you, who else have you submitted to? 
Is the other funders pending? Have they committed? What are the in-kind uh, costs? Um, so the dollar value for an hour for a, a volunteer is set nationally by the independent sector. It's quite high. It's gone up to $32 an hour. So they're really figuring volunteers across a wide uh, array of costs. Um, so you can use that $32 an hour. Say you, it was the 2023 figure from independent sector um, and you can defend it. So, you know, that's a cost of like accountants, business people, you know, teachers, all the different possibilities um, in kind. So when I'm working with Dayton Public Schools, we sign a, um, a rental cost. So if we were an after school program and we were renting uh, Dayton Public Schools, what would probably the, be the cost of that? Well, it's enormous. If they were charging you to be there every day so that they have to have their custodians there later, um, you know, lighting, if they prorated all their utilities to you being there for another three or four hours in the evening, it would be a very high cost. So you want to have work out a, a deal with uh, DPS or Trotwood or Centerville or whoever um, district or um, partner that you have and think about what are those costs. And then ideally, you're going to have them put that in a letter. Okay, so in the narrative, if you were writing a narrative, an actual paragraph, you want to be specific, describe the cost basis. This cost was an average of three bids or an average of three quotes that we um, obtained. Remember, I was looking up in Google for my furniture costs. Link it to the project description and then link it to outcomes. And then we're going to uh, go into the group. And um, originally, we were going to have you uh, look at uh, a budget, but I think that's going to be complicated to do. Um, but what I would like you to do um, for the next uh, few minutes in your breakout room is think about the budget and then think about what we've talked about um program evaluation and the organizational capacity and talk about what are some of the sources of information that you think you could draw from and what do you see as some of the gaps and uh talk about that uh with yourself and alex because she has a younger more nimble brain um, is going to put you in the breakout rooms. Let us know if you have any trouble joining the breakout room. Yeah, and, and do not worry. It's only going to be a couple minutes, and this is just to give you guys question or give you guys the opportunity to talk and then also maybe think of, oh, I have these additional questions I want to ask after. Do not worry. Okay, open them all. Um, all right. Has everybody returned from the breakout rooms? Um, does any of the groups want to be our sacrificial lamb for describing what your discussion uh, was about? And I know it's tricky to think about, okay, we, you know, we've covered this stuff. How, what would our organizational experience or our program evaluation or budget look like? Um, but, you know, does anyone want to share their conversation? Hi, this is Brianna. So I thought I'd go ahead and speak to no one else did. Uh, so I was in the breakout room with, uh, well, her name is C. Mansell on here. <laughs> I'm sorry, my mind has taken it so much Gary. information. Yes, thank you. But um, so we didn't really have any questions about the budget itself and everything that we discussed. So we kind of just had a conversation about why we attended this training, like what organizations that we work with and kind of just got to know a little bit of background information in that time. Good. Good. Yeah. I think, you know, the more people that you can network 
um, the better. Anybody else want to share anything that they uh, picked up from the, the last parts? Or the discussion? So if not, we will wake up the hamster again and we will uh, put him back on the uh, treadmill and make him change the page. Okay, so what's a letter of commitment? And we're gonna talk a little bit about the difference between a letter of commitment or support. A letter of commitment is ideally committing specific resources. And the more specific you can be about that, you know, so like, let's suppose your um, partner is making referrals to you. Well, what's the cost associated with them, um, you know, working with the client, deciding that they need to, to uh, make use of your programs and then making those connections? Um, a lot of programs, like if, if they're a case manager, there's a per hour case management cost. You could say we're going to accept 100 referrals, 100 times that hour of case management cost or whatever. Um, you know, uh, a letter of commitment, you know, you want it to be signed. It can be legally binding. Um, it's pretty rare for foundations to double back and say, did your partners keep all their commitments um, to their percentage? Um, however, the government can, though they do it rarely, they can double back and say, show us that your match was actually a, a achieved. Um, and then a letter of commitment, you know, also just describes that they feel that they want to work with you, um, you know, and that this uh, funding is really needed for the community. Um, in contrast, a letter of support is really just the last thing uh, that we listed. It's basically just saying, you know, we think this is a valuable program. We're very interested in supporting it. Um, and um, we're happy to be part of this project and hope you will fund us. Um, I don't know whether I have it um, broken out separately. But in the government, a lot of uh, letters of commitment actually end up being MOUs, memorandums of understanding between partners. And then there in the memorandum with all the legalese of the whereas and everything, you're describing the same kind of thing. We're committed to this project. This is our role. This is what we're going to do. Um, a lot of times, if there's a financial commitment, they'll make you do an MOU and a letter of support um, because the letter of support becomes the bonding um, commitment on the dollar value. Is this the slide that you're trying to show, the letter of commitment, include if possible? Yeah, it's not showing it. Jeez. Okay, so now it says the resume, bios, and more attachments. Okay. So uh, be gentle with us. I have I've screwed it up again. Um, so letter of commitment. Now we're going to the resumes, uh, more attachments, audits, financial statements. Uh, those are um, attachments you're often going to need to do. And I have... Um, Program descriptions, I actually meant position descriptions. Those are all sort of things that you're going to, to need to add to your application. Okay. Um, so what are the next steps? I always recommend thank your funder regardless of whether you were funded or not. Um, definitely don't challenge them back unless you're prepared to take the negative consequences of that. And sometimes you could. 
I mean, if they do a Rubik score and you feel that your score is unfair um, and you want to challenge it back, let me tell you, the Ohio Department of Education has been challenged back on state applications by uh, school districts. Um, you know, so, you know, one of the things that you would have to do before you would challenge them back was ask uh, for your scores. Um, but basically, you know, the risk of that is that the State Department really doesn't ever want to back down from what their peer reviewers decided. So the, the likelihood that you can turn it over is slim. Um, and you have to look at the repercussions of that. So in general, unless you're willing to, to have a fight, and I used to work for a government agency that, that uh, um, shall remain nameless on this phone call or Zoom call, um, but sometimes, you know, things were heated and even got down to threats of suits, um, you know, and, and litigation over um, how funding was divided up. So, you know, uh, if you feel like you're ducks in a row and you're willing to take that on, um, you can, um, but, you know, that's not the typical thing you do. The typical thing you do is be very thankful that they read your application, send them a warm and fuzzy, gosh, we're, you know, anxious to improve, you know, what, we do to improve, see if they answer that. If they don't answer that, um, come back around. Um, so this is what I want to say is apply again. You may have to wait an interval, um, you know, but it's important to try again. So the city of Dayton made three tries to get promised neighborhoods. Uh, one grant got in. Um, we had uh, a very high score, but we were four points away from being funded. Uh, the second grant we had, uh, Lauren, this gets back to your comment. Uh, we were trying to write it in three weeks. Um, we did get it done. Uh, the third time was the winner. So you have to keep going back. You have to keep going uh, back. The other thing is always plan. If you submitted a strong application, plan for implementing it. Um, particularly the state will come to you with a ridiculous short turnaround time and say, implement this. So 21st century after school grants, they don't let you know until the middle or late August, and they expect you to have that program up, running, licensed, open, recruited, um, teachers in place uh, by October. That's almost impossible unless you were talking and planning while they were reading your application. Um, you know, so I would like us all over the next 20 years, I won't be around, but the next 20 years to change how funders do some things. That would be high on my list. But in the meantime, plan as if you're going to get all the grants you submit that are strong applications. Um, and we're going to go through uh, what is in the Google Drive here for uh, a few minutes, and we're going to take uh, more questions. Um, you know, this really doesn't end here. This is, um, you know, we're trying to give information that would appeal to, you know, medium-sized agencies and people of all skill levels. Um, and that's really hard to do. And it's impossible in two and a half hours, um, you know. So we really want to be a resource. You know, uh, email us with questions. Um, come to the Saturday group. Um, if Saturday doesn't work out for you, we can set up another group. Um, so if we get enough people that are interested, you know, we can have a, a workday group. Um, Saturday was because we had so many neighborhood group members that have other jobs. Um, so they're not really hired by a nonprofit. You know, they have to squeeze us into their evening and weekends. 
Alrighty, so I'm about to share, I just did, it's a link to a Google form. If you guys have any additional questions that you feel like, oh, I really need to sit down and think about it, or we don't get it, I'll get to it by the end of when I kind of show the drive and some examples and everything. Um, you can submit this, um, submit a Google form, just relaying your question. I will be sending this out in the follow-up email, so don't worry if you click on it and then accidentally X out of it. Um, just letting you know that this is a resource that you have. Um, and I actually will start to screen share and show everything that I have. Alrighty, so the first thing that I have up, can it, um, Amy, can you confirm, can you guys see my, this is the, the form? No. Okay, I see the, the thumbs up, so I'll, I'll go with Lauren on this. So this is the form. It's very simple. Just ask for your email and any questions. Let me actually move the little bar. Um, so going into resources, the first thing I actually kind of wanted to show was my own personal little project timeline that I made to kind of give an example of what it could look like when you're working with large amounts of people with like a workshop. My mom is moving out of her house into live with my brother and they asked me to make a timeline um, so I can go into my mom's timeline. This is kind of what I have set up. Um, having different task, task sections, uh, different uh, subtasks, going through everything that needs to get done on time, who owns the task, who is going to be managing it, start date and end date, the duration of it, and then a percent completed. Um, and then if you go through, I have conditional formatting and special things set up that I love doing that can go like changing the date up here to... Um, to fit whatever day it is, to show the duration, what events are going on at the same time. You can make it as complicated or as simple as you want. Um, but this is kind of an example of a workflow timeline that you can go through and have your various task sections, your different titles, and go through who owns it and who's going to be facilitating it. And then really be able to look at, okay, well, if I'm starting this one on this date, is there something else I can do at the same time or have another person handle that and really see a full layout of a timeline. And if you just Google Gaunt chart, I think it's like G-A-N-T-T -T or timeline, there should be downloadable resources online for Google Sheets, Excel that could have this pre-made for you. Cause I know I like working in Excel, others may not, I fully understand. Um, but this is just kind of an example of like a timeline that's not something you'll find on Google that was just like a, a pre-made one. Um, this is what my family uses to, to get it all situated and, and figure out where everything is. So if you guys want any help with making timelines, that is one thing I am an expert at. So um, please reach out. Like I said, we'll be giving all resources after. Um, so what I'm actually going to go through is the QR code that was shared at the beginning and the link that we will be sending out. So don't worry, um, is the link to the grant writing training drive. Now, this drive has almost everything you can think of if you have questions. One, it has the exact training slide deck from today uh, with including all of the hidden slides that we did from the one that was in person. So it'll have even more details and even more examples and whatnot. Um, there are example budgets, um, example, like anything you can really think of. Here is a drive of example grants that you can look at that Amy worked through that um, really they're different types. You can see how they're written, what they did, how they did their timeline. Um, and if you have any questions, you can email us and, or make a meeting. Um, there's a list of local foundations that Amy compiled that could be really beneficial that was even shared at the Saturday meeting this past Saturday. Um, and you can ask questions and look through them and look through our PowerPoints and kind of compare. Um, also going the logic model that I talked about that we didn't mention, but we could have. Um, there is a folder here that kind of goes over the logic model and kind of goes through some examples. And there also is a section on some manuals for federal grant writing and really just a lot of resources that you can use. All of this is free resources. They will be open on a link. You can access them at any time. And if you have any questions, we would be more than happy to help. For the recording for today's session, I will be uploading it here additionally. So if you lose the email that this is on, let's say six from six months from now, you're like, oh, like, where do I even find it? I, I forgot. It will all be here and it all will be accessible and available for you for free. 
So if you guys have any questions about the drive, about timelines, about really anything, we're here to support you. If you don't feel like setting a meeting up, we have the Google form that you can submit questions to and we'll respond to it and try to keep updated with it. The person who runs it is Kayla. She is another intern that works with us and she's the one who knows all about the budgets. She is actually just right now taking an accounting exam somewhere off in the world um, or at least traveling to it. So she'll be able to help with budgets and she'll be the one tracking if any new responses come in. Um, so I will stop sharing and we can allow for the next couple minutes any questions we can speak on it and then hopefully we'll be able to let you guys out a few minutes early so you can stretch your legs yawn and use the bathroom and comment about how zoom meetings suck <laughs> all righty if anybody has questions you can either post it in the chat or because we are at the end you can unmute and speak yes would you guys uh be able to send your like linkedin information as well just in case we do lose your email or it gets lost or something yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah I'll, we'd I'll be happy to do that we would be happy to do that um there is a question oh google form says you need permission i will fix that do not worry um i will resend it and everything i'm not kayla must have made it private or something um and the additional question was just to clarify about the group that it meets every fourth saturday yes Yes, so it meets every uh, fourth Saturday, um, 10 a.m. to noon, uh, just informal, come as you are, jeans, shorts, anything, um, enjoy some snacks and um, talk about uh, projects and, you know, do planning and, and uh, you know, we just try to dig in as much as we can. If you want us to meet individually with your agency, uh, let us know uh, that as well. You know, um, we do have one person said that they're interested. Jessica said she's interested in a weekday grants group. Um, so do we have more people? I don't know whether you guys want to do your thumbs up or your reaction thing here, but do we have more people interested? In a weekday group? Yes. Okay. Okay, so we'll schedule that um, and uh, let you guys. Um, what we did last time was we sent out a survey and gave different times, and then we talked um, what was the most prevalent time, prevalent, whatever, time. Uh, I'm just short of a nursing home. <laughs> um, any other questions? I would say so we had somebody who had said interested in one on one, one on one as well. So that's great too. So we're happy to schedule that. Just reach out to us. And we are going to be uploading um, some more information into that um, website, uh, the Google Drive. Uh, one thing, the federal manual for grant writing that we have talks about Dunn's number. That's totally changed. It's now a unique entity identifier. So we're going to be taking that manual and uh, updating it a little bit um, as well. Um, so please let us know what's missing there. Um, I've got some timelines that I can um, um, add uh, to the uh, group and some different kinds of things. So let us know. I also just made a new form um, so everyone could have access. Could someone click on it and maybe give me a thumbs up that anybody is allowed to open it? I think the last one only allowed University of Dayton users to open it. So sorry about that. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's the default here. Yeah, that was the that... default setting. And I know Kayla's traveling right now, so I don't want to take her and be like, hey, OK, I see I can't access. Awesome. Um, so we can use that form. And if any of the Udayton people submitted a question to the other form, form do not worry. We'll still answer them and everything. Um, so yeah, do, do we have any last minute questions? Uh, we also have some groups that are sharing grants. 
Um, so if you're interested in uh, doing that, um, you know, uh, where you're willing to have other people. Um, we don't want people to to take word for word, lift word for word what you've written, but if you want to share your ideas um, and want to be part of mutual sharing, um, one of the entities that said they were willing to share wanted to make sure that they uh, people understood that they wanted it to be reciprocal. You know, so that like if you were going to use part of it that you might, you know, invite them to participate in your grant as well. Um, if we have anybody interested in urban farming, we are getting together on September 5th um, to discuss a USDA uh, grant that's going to address uh, food. Well, it's not just urban farming, it's going to be um, food access. Um, and so send me a thing and I can uh, send you more details about that as well. Uh, that's with uh, Central State and a variety of agencies on uh, September 5th. So we are going to give you, if anybody has any other questions. <laughs>